proxy to the kind of energy density argument you saw before. Things go slowly when you can't commercialize them. I mean, that's fairly self-evident. The basis of cost for CCS is higher than the prevailing average price of the emissions trading schemes, both here in the UK or equivalent schemes globally. So there is no incentive to develop large capex intensive projects from industry. It is simply cheaper to emit. As that emissions trading scheme price increases, particularly when we move into the territory of carbon border adjustment mechanisms, and we start to price the carbon equivalent cost of imports, and we saw what that would look like for aluminium a moment ago, then we start to see a future option value developing in the industry. But for now, how does the government square the need to keep industrial jobs in the UK while decarbonizing that industry? So government is looking at revenue support in the UK for the capture projects to be able to essentially, in a similar way to be deployed offshore wind in the UK, that contracts for difference mechanism where there's a strike price and you, the, there's a revenue support to the difference. If you imagine the difference here being the levelized cost of abatement of the carbon capture and storage chain and the ETAS price being the floor, and that difference changing over time, that is the revenue support framework that's being proposed here in the UK. So we look at these three things as key when we look at any CCS opportunity globally. What is the basis for the CO2 price? And how is that supported by government policy? Nobody wants CO2 or very limited demand, although it certainly gets headlines when we run out of it and there can't be any beverage industry in the UK anymore. But the basis of CO2 price in terms of the volume that we're dealing with, millions of tons, is very important. And that will be subsidized for the initial period. So then we look at the cross-chain risk allocation. So what do I mean by that? So if you have a sub-commercial product, okay, great that there's a, a tax credit. For example, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US gets talked about a lot. How do you manage the cross-chain liabilities? You know, these are very large capex-intensive projects. The 15 million tons per annum we talk about with our capture project partners, RWE, VPI, Phillips 66, to reach 15 million tons a year by 2035, that will be a total investment of seven billion pounds over that decade. Now, 80 to 90% of that is on the capture side, not on the side of the business the harbor will be developing, but you get a scale of the amount of money that's at risk. These are separate commercial companies. What if the capture side builds and the transport and storage doesn't, or vice versa? That stranded asset risk has to be managed and will be priced into the risk of the business, therefore increasing the price disparity on the left-hand side. So government, the UK government's approach to this is to put in place a suite of well thought through of complex business models to manage the cross-chain liabilities, where essentially what that means is that government will act as an insurer of last resort should the chain not develop. Now clearly with that amount of taxpayer money on the line, government needs to make sure these projects are deliverable and can be brought together. So in the UK, there are four transport and storage networks decarbonizing four industrial clusters to meet that UK policy target. Each one of those four is on the pathway to receiving an economic license, and Harbour is invested in two of them. We are operating Viking, and we're the non-operated partner in Acorn. And that's what Elizabeth meant when she referred to the track two process. Essentially, that's the government's due diligence process for how the basis of pricing support and the cross-chain risk management comes in. And that really provides for quite a low risk and therefore stable cash flow in the future. And we've tested this in the investment community. And these business models are believed to be bankable at the point of an FID in the contract award with government because of those backstops, attracting a low cost of finance and therefore reducing the overall cost of the deployment. And you can start to see the government's intent about lowering that cost to be able to incentivize an industry for a future marketplace that can develop. So finally, on this slide then, Containment, assurance, and liability. The CO2 has to stay stored. Otherwise, we're liable. You know, we take title and risk to the CO2 when it comes into our pipeline. So what is that liability and how do you measure it? And this has been a major issue in terms of deploying the industry in the UK and Europe in the past. Because if you think that through from a practical perspective, you get paid today in current ETS prices, but it leaks in several decades at a future ETS price that you can't price in. And that is uninsurable. There is no commercial market for insurance for that currently. So the government, again, is putting in an agreement where it is the insurer of last resort to enable the stories to develop. Now, that doesn't reduce the obligation on the developers to make sure that the CO2 will stay stored for geological time. 
And that's why we always start the story of Viking around about why is it such a capable store? And we believe it's a capable store, and our independent evaluation believes it's a capable store as well because of the data we have to prove it. So we talked about the pre-salt before in Brazil. So these gas fields in the UK are also pre-salt. And that salt is a very important part of this story because it provides 500 to 1,000 feet of high-strength cap rock. That cap rock is what keeps the CO2 contained. It's impermeable to flow. The CO2 can't get through it. If for any reason a crack did happen in salt, salt's mobile under pressure, so it self-heals. And the fracture strength, so apologies, an engineer, the strength of the salt is times two of what we would repressurize the reservoir to. So we have a huge margin in terms of how we safely operate these sites. Now, clearly, we've operated these sites, so we have legacy wells in the structures. So it's great having what has been described as a world-class super seal over the sites. But if you've got holes in it, then you've got a problem. But we've also been the operator who has decommissioned those wells. We have led the plugging and abandonment of each of these wells in the field over the time of our tenure in the Southern North Sea and therefore our best place to use that data and that expertise to assess the containment risk, which is low in terms of these sites. We have, and you can see in the bottom graphic, apologies, it's a little bit small, a number of sites that we can store CO2 in. And that gives us a scalability to our capital investment program, which benefits because of the uncertainty as to what will the CO2 demand be from the capture projects that will be brought forward. So in, in terms of what that means, we can develop the initial site down here at Victor to the south, which is the largest and best quality sand in the, in the structure, and then scale from this platform to future platforms over time as the demand evolves, meaning that we spend roughly half as much capital in that first investment decision as could be needed to fully scale out to the overall license acreage. So a bit of a schematic here. So, you know, we think about risk in a lot of different facets. We have risk in terms of the regulatory context and the commercial context. That's higher for CCS because the value chain hasn't been proved in the UK. So we want to counteract that risk by minimizing the engineering risk. So we have deliberately taken a design decision to push the complexity into the capture plants because there's multiple capture plants. So if one of those goes down, there's still others feeding into the system. So we have a very simple engineering system where we have a straight run of pipeline from the capture facilities, which I'll describe on my next slide, to picking up the offshore pipeline to coming into a very basic offshore installation. The offshore installation is a platform. It's in 30 meters water depth, so very shallow, 2,500 tons. We built about 40 of these in our 40 years of operation in the Southern North Sea. This is in our sweet spot as harbor for offshore installation development small jacket structures, subsea tiebacks, very scalable, independent of the fluid that's being transported. So on to the capture side then. So what you see here is a series of pictures for what attracted us to the Humber region and to Immingham. So I mentioned before that, you know, the ConocoPhillips part of the legacy harbor business operated and developed the Southern North Sea over 40 years. But we also developed as part of the Phillips 66 part of that business before the upstream and downstream parts spun off the Phillips refinery, which is in the foreground to this image. The Phillips refinery is actually one of the most advanced in the UK. It represents 20% of the UK's refining capacity. And next door to it, the Prax refinery is the other 20%. So 40% of the UK's refining in that localized footprint. And then across the road is the power station that ConocoPhillips also built, which is a combined heat and power plant, Europe's largest, purpose-built to feed steam and electricity into the refineries. So a designed ecosystem that is meant to be energy efficient. I mentioned the refinery is one of the most advanced because it's Europe's only supplier of synthetic graphite. Lithium dominates the airwaves for batteries. The other part of the battery, the anode, is based on graphite. The only source in Europe outside of China is that one. So we can enable these low carbon products of the future through decarbonizing the refinery's operations and its adjacent power station. Adjacent to this and just off shot, you can just see it to the top of the right-hand picture, is one of the UK's busiest deep water ports, the Port of Immingham. We've been working together with ABP since 2021 in the development of the new integrated energy jetty, as you see here in the image, which will be dual purpose for ammonia and also for CO2, green ammonia imports and CO2 
imports into our network. The proximity to our pipeline you can see here in the Immingham facilities itself. So a really exciting balance is why we look at the concept of place. Just to bring it back to the start, we have a UK's largest industrial region. We have the UK's largest deep water port capable of very large gas carriers for a future European import. We have high capacity proven storage sites that we've operated for 40 years and we can bring existing infrastructure to lower that deployment cost. And we believe those mer merits, combined with the support from the UK government and a well thought through structured series of business models, gives us a great opportunity to add to the mix Elizabeth talked about before in terms of that complementary stable cash flow with a higher value option in future as the dynamics for the CO2 marketplace change and it becomes a tradable commodity. That was me. I welcome any questions. You stay. We have time for one question here. Yes, he's an investor. Yes. Uh, well, you showed a lot about CCS and my future there, but I never see some figures. How much is the total rate of return? Because investors are interested in that. And secondly, why you see because you storage that where you pumped out the oil. This is uh, this is not yours. It's the U UK government uh, owns it and. Uh, how you are sure that if that would be a great business in the future, this Banana Republic government in the UK not takes away 100% as it does in the mm -hmm. uh, Because I think this is the, the, the question, this is really important for me as an investor. Yeah, so a couple of parts to that. So in terms of the investment rate of return, so the deployment of these business models is government supported. So therefore, they're looking at what's called an economic license. So similar to how you would see a transmission business or a utility business. And that will probably lead to post-financing, low double-digit rates of return for the CCS in the UK. That is roughly what we would expect, subject to negotiation. But there's a lot of value we can bring into that through how we look at project finance, through how we deliver the project well, under cost and on time, through how we bring other infrastructure to the project, and also through the option value of future shipping. So that is how we view both the initial low risk and lower return part of the business with a future option value. In terms of the UK's need for private sector investment, they simply will need the private sector investment and the developers in order to scale these projects over time. So in terms of the business model, the tax is included within that business model rate of return, so that is accounted for. And in terms of a future non-regulated market, that's going to be one of our core negotiating objectives with government around about how do we make sure there's an appropriate gain share between what the value we wish to see in terms of utilizing our knowledge in developing these sites for future import of CO2 from non-UK sources, as well as how the government views it in terms of the use of the natural resources within the UK seabed. Thanks a lot. Because of uh, time, but you're going to stay here.